Okay, everybody. In this one, we're going to talk about interest groups. And interest groups have a really, really profound influence on our electorate. And it's kind of something that's really sad and really unfortunate. Uh, both sides use interest groups to their advantage. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> how interest groups are involved in the political process. And then we're going to go over um, lobbying and uh, a, a Supreme Court case called Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission, which kind of really changed the way elections are conducted here in the United States. And then we'll also look at limits and uh, other types of interest groups, organizations that are out there, and, and we'll talk about how they can affect the political system. And we'll also have some supplemental videos that are going to be attached to this section. Uh, one talking about Jack Abramoff, who is an infamous lobbyist. Uh, and when you when I use the word infamous, you'll get the reason why that I chose those words um, when you see the video. Uh, so, you know, this is kind of where we're headed on this. OK, so when we look at interest groups, <clears throat> usually a pluralist, remember, somebody that is is involved more in the collective bargaining view of politics, uh, pluralists consider interest groups to be good because they can link us with the government. At, you know, they can have the government hear our concerns and address any grievances that we have. They can enhance individual well-being by fighting for interests that may improve our lives. Um, they can help reduce potentially divisive conflicts and they can provide stability. But you also, you know, kind of coming out of it and coming out of these types of thoughts, there are some assumptions that pluralist theory would attach to interest groups. Uh, one's going to probably have to say, well, you know, in order for all this to happen, membership in an organization has to be, uh, widespread and everybody's uh, views are represented. Groups effectively translate members' expectation into political demands, and each group should have political access to the political resources necessary for success. Um, you know, now when we look at this, we can probably make the assumption that this is a very, very optimistic view of interest groups. So we're going to kind of go along with the fact that interest groups, much like other groups here in the United States, are going to be an elitist type of organization. And what do I mean by that? Remember, if we go all the way back to the first chapter, we talk about something called the iron law of oligarchy. The iron law of oligarchy basically says that in any type of organization, there's going to be an elite and there's going to be a larger group below that elite that is consenting to what the elite wants them to do. And interest groups kind of tie into the same thing as, you know, you may have a, an interest group who is, you know, taking a position on an issue where the masses might feel a certain way, but the elites in that organization may feel different. And they may feel that, you know, hey, you know, we're the ones that are putting up the money. We're the ones that are running this organization. Our grievances or our wants should be heard. And we'll talk a little bit about that kind of going through the through the through this uh, section. Now, interest groups have a class bias. You know, most organizations have a strong middle upper class bias. Uh, for example, upper class, upper, upper middle class blacks led the civil rights organizations. Um, I think one of the reasons with this, and I think what the author is trying to say is that some of us may not have the time to participate in these interest groups. We may lack focus. We may lack energy because we're working 40 hours a week. We don't have extra disposable money to contribute to these groups. So generally, people who are upper earners in our society may have more time and money to spend. Liberal causes are drawn from the university, educated and academically connected. Um, you know, when we talk about ideologies, uh, there's kind of a, especially in the social sciences, there is a belief that once you um, kind of gain more education or once you become more knowledgeable about a subject, you, your views tend to become a little bit more liberal. And I know that's pretty much 
very true in the social sciences. I'm not quite sure about business or other types of disciplines, but definitely in the social sciences, this happens. Um, only a minority are active in an interest group. So a lot of people might belong to some type of group, and we'll talk about the different types of groups in a minute, but only a small few are active. And those are generally the people that shape what the views of that interest groups are going to be. So if we talk about different types of interest groups and different types of organizations, uh, within the business and union organizations, we have interests such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers. And then we have specific business interests or that are also represented by trade associations. We have groups like the American Bankers Association, the American Iron and Steel Institute. And these are all groups that advocate for what their what the elites in their organizations want. There's also a huge influence on labor and organized labor and a lot of influence that comes out of organized labor. Um, labor unions at one time were very prevalent through our workforce but kind of since the evolution of of you know businesses and business practices uh union membership has gone down power is still concentrated in a lot of these unions uh the democratic party really depends on some of these organized labor groups for political contributions uh, so they're still pretty influential, influential, but bit membership has gone down. I think I saw a figure that in the 50s, about 60 percent of the workforce belonged to a union. Uh, now it's roughly about 13 percent. And a lot of those unions that are part of that 13 percent come from government employee unions that have become very, very powerful. Um, one of the more powerful ones, and this is one you may have heard of, is SEIU. They're very powerful here in in, in uh, the county of San Diego. Um, there are service workers, so it could be anybody from a uh, from a social worker to a hotel worker, and so on. And uh, back in two thousand and eight, they gave thirty million dollars to Barack Obama uh, to help fund his election. And you know, if you think about kind of the situation on what money is used for, one thing that money is used for in politics is to buy access. So the more money you give, the more access you get because politicians want to keep receiving those donations. So, I mean, if if somebody gave me $30 million to run for president and there was an issue that was affecting them, I'm pretty much I'm sure I'm going to be in contact with them and seeing what uh, they would not in a sense tell me what to do, but what I could do to help them. We have the American Federation of Labor, which is still pretty strong. Uh, the FLCIO, um, and we have farm workers unions that kind of started out of the in the in the in the fifties and the sixties and became very powerful once they were able to to uh, kind of merge together. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, you know, there are both liberal and conservative views on special interests. Um, but just keep in mind that these different groups have a profound influence. It doesn't matter if one's conservative or one's liberal. It doesn't mean that neither uses interest group money or neither are influenced by interest group money. Uh, but, you know, different groups will represent different interests and usually could tie them to a liberal group, a liberal group like maybe PETA against a conservative group like maybe the NRA, the National Rifle Association. And that brings us to single issue interest groups. And these interest groups concentrate on a single or an ideological cause, whether it's pro choice, uh, pro life, uh, gun rights, uh, gun law advocates. Um, and these attract members who are extremely, extremely committed to their cause. And some of the examples of them are the NRA, the National Rifle Association, which is a pro gun group. Uh, Emily's List. Emily's List is a is a organization that looks for pro-choice women to run for Congress, and they help fund elections. I think out of all the groups that we kind of talk about, I think MAD is one of the more neutral groups, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. 
um, you know, advocating for tougher drunk driving laws, maybe tougher drunk, uh, maybe tougher or more stringent education on the dangers of drunk driving. I remember in high school, we had a visit by them and they brought a bunch of videos and pictures and, and, a, and, a, and a in a wreck car. Uh, so they do outreach like that. And we have our pro-life and our pro-choice groups uh, that are out there. And like I said, these people are generally going to be very, very committed to their cause. We also have civil rights organizations. And um, a couple of the ones that are, are famous are the NAACP and the Urban League, uh, the African-American rights groups, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was you know, organized and nonviolent protest efforts uh, during the Martin Luther King Jr. days. Uh, the National Council of La Raza, advocates of Latino rights and Latino votes who do a lot of go out, get out the vote campaigns to get uh, Latinx people to participate in elections. Uh, the Anti-Defamation League, which fights bigotry in all forms, promotes religious freedom and separation of church and state. Now we have women's groups, and when we get into the civil rights section, we'll go into a little bit more of these types of groups and some more specifics. But for now, we're just going to keep it real general. Uh, we have women's groups. You know, this dates all the way back to anti-slavery uh, societies, um, and it kind of played a role in passing the Eighteenth Amendment, which prohibited alcohol, um, the the use of alcohol and the sale of alcohol. Um, League of Women Voters, they provide information to voters, uh, back registrations, get out the vote efforts. And the most famous and the most active women's rights organization is the National Organization of Women. Now, the National Organization for Women, sorry. We have LGBTQIA groups, the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, uh, GLAD, which is probably the more, most famous one, Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Human Rights Campaign in Equality California. And like I said, we'll get into a little bit more deeper delve when we get into the civil rights part of this class. Now, we also had farm workers movements that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, the United Farm Workers uh, uh, was developed by a merger between the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, who was led by a Filipino-American named Larry Itzalog, and uh, the National Farm Workers Association, who was led by Cesar Chavez and Dolores, Dolores Huerta. Uh, they merged and became the United Farm Workers uh, Union. And one, you know, kind of a personal story about this. Um, my grandfather, um, my dad is white. My mother is Mexican Native American. Uh, my grandfather on my Mexican side uh, was a farm worker up in uh, the Tulare County area or the Tular area up in Kings County um, in Central California during this time. And he... Uh, um, worked uh, for farmers and stuff like that and uh, was um, uh, front and center when the Cesar Chavez uh, um, situation happened. Now, um, my grandfather actually passed before I was born, but my mother, who also was a, a farm worker during the time, told me that uh, my grandfather was a little bit afraid of Cesar Chavez because um, he was a, my, my grandfather was a very kind of uh introverted person and didn't like conflict and thought that possibly this could affect their work. So he didn't really get involved too much, but, you know, hearing some of the st stories that my mother told me um, about how they were treated, you could see absolutely why uh, they needed some type of representation to prevent some of the abuses that were going on. Um, one of the more famous things is the Delano grape strike, which was a collaboration between Filipino and Mexican workers who traditionally began uh, been recruited to work during the other group's protest actions. So um, they had wanted a 25 cent an hour raise. Um, they merged through nonviolent protest and uh, in order to be able to try to improve their wages, uh, their ability to get education, their housing and legal protections. The grape strike started and ended for it started from 1965 and ended in 1970. Uh, there were some instances of scab labor. Uh, scab labor is kind of a pejorative term of people working either crossing the picket line, or uh, when a, when when an organization is on strike, scab, the term scab means 
when somebody crosses the picket line or they hire an outside worker to come in and take a union worker's position. Um, some workers were earning less than federal minimum wage, and as a result of the grapes not being picked, uh, many grapes were spoiled and rotten, rotten, rotted, especially up in some of the Napa area where a lot of the, the wineries are at. By the 70s, the UFW boy, Great Boycott was a success, and they, uh, the, t the growers signed their first um, union contract getting uh, granny workers better pay benefits and protections and kind of to talk a little bit about the problems that farm workers experienced and you know i heard this from my mother as well uh you know they labored in humane conditions especially in the central valley um working um long hours especially in the hot sun without protection and uh without water breaks uh, my mom said that they didn't use used to let you drink any water because you weren't. Uh, you know, I guess the time it took for uh for you to take a drink of water hampered your productivity. So I, as you can imagine, especially during a uh, uh, you know a warm weather period, uh, that was uh, something that was really really not cool. Um, a lot of sexual harassment too, a lot of assaults. So. You know, just kind of getting into some of the facts that the farm workers experienced and uh, the passage of the union contracts kind of of really helped, you know, didn't totally solve a lot of the issues that were occurring, but helped and provided some type of uh, recourse or some type of reference point for uh, uh, the workers to be able to have their grievances hurt now when we talk about you know kind of the uh, the fact between whether a large group a large interest group is more effective than a small group interest than a small interest group um obviously large groups are going to have more access and they're going to have greater access but smaller groups aren't necessarily going to be left out in the cold as if you have a hot button issue, a small group can have a very effective um, or a very prevalent influence on having their grievances hurt. Now, like we said, we talked about trade association groups earlier, um, the AFL-CIO, the Inter International Brotherhood of Teamsters are examples. <laughs> If we look at single interest versus traditional interest, single interest groups focus on one narrow concern, one narrow problem, one narrow interest. With the decline of political parties, candidates have turned to single issue, single interest groups who whose influence has grown mightily and who has a profound influence over the electorate. You know, pro-choice groups, the NRA, on both sides, they have some very, very profound influence with money. Now, let's talk about lobbying. And lobbying, I think, for lack of a better term, lobbying is a legal form of bribery when you think about it. Lobbying is any communication, and let me add to that, any money that is directed to governor, government decision maker with the hopes of influencing their decisions. It is a continuous activity, and the most heavily lobbied branch of government is Congress. So they're the ones that make the laws. Can the executive branch get lobbied? Yes, in some instances. Can the judicial branch get lobbied? I don't believe so because I would be, uh, I would imagine there are laws about. Yeah, you know, I know there are laws that prevent. Uh, you know, maybe judges taking money for for a. For an interest, like say something like privatization of prisons, um, which we could probably talk about when we get to the criminal justice part of this class. Uh, I do know there was a, a, a federal judge that uh, was charged with bribery for trying for putting uh, people into prison, some certain prison prison sentences uh, that. They would be put in a privatized prison. You know, privatization of prisons uh, is a very controversial subject when you think, you know, should prison be a business? 
what's the business goal, make money, how do prisons make money, having more people in their custody. So, you know, it's something we'll talk about later, but we could see that, you know, Congress is going to be the most lobbied group. Um, probably the most important thing to have in lobbying is access. And that you that means you have personal contacts with decision makers. You have their emails. You know their chiefs of staff. And in fact, people that get out of Congress usually go into lobbying. In a sense, in, in lobby groups, you make more money as well. Being a lobbyist can be a lot more lucrative than being a member of Congress. Here are our top lobbying firms. You can see they, uh, uh, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Shrek spent uh, $15 million in lobbying. And you can see the different groups and uh, millions and millions of dollars that are spent on lobbying. Lobbyists can get information and they can also provide information. Once access is grant gained, information is the most valuable resource. Lobbyists can track bills affecting their interests. And they can complement the functions of congressional staff by providing information, information for debates, speeches. That could be something like data, surveys, anything that can help that member of Congress. Go ahead and, and, and go ahead and skip over this slide. It's really not that relevant that we're talking about. Some of these lobbyist groups can be grassroots. Uh, you mobilize constituents to apply pressure, email calls, visit by local elites. Uh, mobilize the press and elites in a congressional member's home district, uh, you know, kind of starting at the very bottom with a little bit of influence and then building a, a an organization that has a profound influence, you know, starting it at the very, very bottom and, you know, have a whole grassroots movement that gives your interest group some momentum where you can eventually get that access to the members of Congress. A lot of these influential lobbyists will have direct contacts, right? They'll have members of Congress's cell phone numbers. They'll know their chiefs of staff. Um, they'll know how bills work. Um, they might know maybe some dirt on the member of Congress. So all of these direct contacts are very, very important in to have in for lobbyists to have in their playbook. If we look at where some where some lobby groups and interest groups are successful, the real key to to be successful in lobbying is to um, you know generate campaign support and to be able to get money to a candidate. Uh, the Democrats will rely rely on lawyers, uh, lobbyists, law firms, Hollywood, and labor unions. The Republican Party will rely on real estate and home building industries, oil and gas, pharmaceutical and health, and the manufacturing organizations. So <clears throat> how do we regulate lobbyists? Okay, so there has to be disclosure. So disclosure laws require lobbyists to register as lobbyists and report how much they spend. Um, but the definition of lobbying are unclear and enforcement is weak. Uh, lobby Law requires that any money that is spent on direct lobbying needs to be reported. And there are ways to be able to check this. Now, in turn, we also have something called a political action committee. And these are non-party organizations that solicit voluntary contributions to disperse the political candidates. We're going to have a flowchart uh, come up in a little bit, and we'll show you how that will, will work. Uh, a large number of these PACs or these political action committees are going to be in the corporate sector. PAC, political action committees or PACs prefer incumbents. 90% of the time in an election, the incumbent will win. So in this instance, PACs are going to bet, bet money on the favorite. It's not like a horse race where you bet money on the long shot. In this case, you're going to bet money on the winner. PAC money is overwhelmingly goes to incumbents because the objective is access. 
we'll go ahead and take a look at this and talk about interest groups of money. Interest group contributions need to be reported to the Federal Election Commission. If you want to take a look at a website, there is a website called OpenSecrets.org. And what this website does is it provides a database and you can look up at uh, look for your member of Congress and you can see how much money they have taken from interest groups. So as part of this, the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, or it's also called the McCain-Feingold Act, is a federal law that regulates the financing of political campaigns. So we have two types of money. We have hard money and we have soft money. Hard money is money contributed directly to a specific candidate, while indirect contributions to political parties and political action committees are considered soft money. So an example of hard money is, see, I give money to Joe Biden's 2020, 2024, 2024 campaign, and it has to be reported to the FBC. There are limits on this individual donation. And I believe right now the limit for an individual donation per election cycle is $2,900. Stop money is different. Say I give the money to the Republican Party, and then the party gives money to a candidate. Because soft money is not regulated by election laws, companies, unions, individual individuals may give donations in an amount, any amount to a political party for the purpose of party building. The party can then buy ads, educate voters, talk about the issues, and tell what what the party wants the electorate to hear. Like I said, here are the individual contribution limits. See here as an individual, I can only give $2,900 to, uh, $2, to a candidate, but I can give $10,000 to a local or state party, and I can give $36,000, $36,500 to a national party. So here's kind of the flow chart. Introduce Interest groups and campaigns will use political action committees to hire lobbyists to lobby candidates. And as long as you're within those reporting requirements, you are totally within the law. So if you are a member of an interest group and I'm running for president of the United States and you give me money and you report it and I take it and I report it, everything is legal. There's a little bit more about political action committees, the definition. We talked about that. There's also something called super PACs. And super PACs and these 527 PACs are organizations that can raise and spend unlimited amounts of money promoting or attacking candidates. At the end of this video, I'm going to attach a Stephen Colbert bit where he kind of shows the ridiculousness of super PACs. He tried to run for president of South Carolina. He had originally started a super PAC prior to that, but since he became a candidate, he could no longer be affiliated with a super PAC. It's all pretty comical, but it is kind of eyebrow raising when you think about it. So um, super PACs can raise and spend unlimited amounts of money promoting or attacking a candidate. As long as they are not receiving direction from that candidate. So say I'm running for president and you are a super PAC. I can't tell you what to do, but you can either raise money or buy ads or even spend money to defeat me as long as we're not coordinating. Right. So let me repeat that again, because it's kind of a little bit of a tricky thing here. I'm running for president and you support me. You can buy ads and you can spend as much of your own money as you want as long as I'm not affiliated with you, right? So I can't direct you. Now, say we're both liberal, right? And I'm running against a conservative. I also can't tell you to spend money attacking the other side. You're within your right to attack the other side, but 
I can't direct that. And this all comes out of a court case called Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission. In January of 2010, uh, the Supreme Court held that if you restricted the amount of money, independent political expenditures without, or let me rephrase that, if you prohibited the government from restricting independent political expenditures by nonprofit corporations, for profit corporations, labor unions, and other associations, that is a violation of the First Amendment. Citizens United was a conservative 501c group, meaning they were a nonprofit organization founded in 1988. They uh, wanted to make, or they wanted to air a movie that was critical of Hillary Clinton. It was called Hillary the Movie. Um, this was in violation of that bipartisan campaign reform act that we talked about earlier. Um, so they're about election com uh, electioneering communication. So you couldn't um, show a kind of a disparaging video or a disparaging documentary about a candidate 60 days before the general election or 30 days before a primary. What they found was if you restricted groups from doing that, you were violating their First Amendment right to freedom of speech. So um, kind of to go over it and to look at that. So remember, and this is a very important part that I want you to take from this. Look at this. A nonprofit corporation, a for-profit corporation, a labor union, and an other or associations can spend a limited amounts of money promoting a candidate or deriding a candidate. Right? So they could up, they could support a candidate or they can oppose a candidate. They could spend unlimited amounts of money. But remember, I want you to be able to look at this and take this from what we're talking about here. We as individuals are only entitled to spend $2,900 per election. So when we talk about access, right? Who's going to have more access? Me with my $2,900 or a corporation or labor union that is able to spend unlimited amounts of money to have me elected or have my opponent uh, talk bad about so just kind of to put that all in perspective, right? So just think about that. If you think, if you get anything out of what we're talking about here, kind of think about that and how that may not be totally fair. All right. Um, remember opensecrets.org. That is the website that I want you to go on and take a look at. Okay. Thanks a lot. I have a super PAC, Colbert super PAC. Yeah. As far as I can tell, the difference between a PAC and a super PAC is a cover letter. Because I formed a PAC, but a PAC can only take so much money and can only spend so much money. And I wanted to spend unlimited amounts of money and receive, more importantly, unlimited amounts of money. And so my lawyer told me all I had to do was add a cover letter that said, I intend this to be a super PAC. And it was a super PAC. And it all happened by accident. I just said, you know, maybe we'll, uh, let's get the let's get the URL ColbertPack.com just mm -hmm. for fun for my show. And the network called and said, "You just bought a, a political action committee website. Are you really going to get a political action committee?" And I said, "Why do you ask?" Mm -hmm. And they said, "Because if if you do, that could be trouble." And I said, "Well, then I'm going to do that." Yeah, you, Ted Koppel. Why doesn't Ted Koppel have a super PAC? It is legal for you to have a super PAC and talk about it on the air and. The FEC won't do anything about it. And I could get lots of contributions. You could. And you could finally have a voice in America. I feel, don't, don't you want your voice to be heard? I, I feel like such a fool. But what I, like I, what I found, well, the most amazing thing is I found out is that there, are, there is almost nothing that's against the law when it comes to spending political money. They're incredibly expensive. <laughs> okay. Super PAC paid for these babies. There's nothing in federal election law that says I couldn't use all the money to buy myself a sailboat. Is that true? That's true. If, is, if it's not illegal, you can use Super PAC money to buy it. it My can be cause anything. could be to educate people of how big of a boat I have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wish, I wish that were a joke. But you, you couldn't keep it for private use, could you? I could, yeah, sure. 
Really? I could do. Wait, Nuke, so that's what Newt Gingrich has been living on. He's been living on his PAC money. And Sarah Palin. Sarah PAC, you know, the little right. vacation she took that. with her yes. family mm -hmm. last year where mm -hmm. she said Paul Revere, you know, right. went around shooting his gun. Mm -hmm. um, that was all paid for by Super PAC money. How much money have you, have you collected so far? Oh, the fun thing about that is I don't have to tell you. Well, you have to tell me who sends it to you. No, not for a while. Well, eventually. Eventually I, I do, but every, until then, every, every my major months. donor is none of your damn business. But every three, every three months. Mm, it's every three months once you start reporting. But I actually formed this back in July, and I still haven't reported yet. And what can happen to you? What? I could go to FEC jail. But they don't send people to jail. Well, then I guess nothing will happen to me. Well, they can find you. They can find me, but they have to actually rule that I did something wrong. And the FEC is a 3-3 organization, and right. they're far more likely to come to a tie, in, which, in case, which case they say, we don't know whether you've done anything wrong, in which case I can keep doing what I want. You cannot be a candidate and run a super PAC. That would be coordinating with yourself. And that's the problem, folks. Presidential candidates cannot coordinate with super PACs. Mr. Speaker, are you, giving, are you giving any direction or advice to winning our future? The no. Time? Are you affiliated with them at all? I'm not affiliated with them at all. I don't talk with them at all. There's a bright uh, uh, division uh, between what I do and what any super PAC can do. Super PACs have to be entirely separate from a campaign and a candidate. I'm not allowed to communicate with a super PAC in any way, shape, or so form. You... Super PACs are often run by people close to the candidate. The pro-Romney super PAC, Restore Our Future, was founded by Romney's lawyer. Winning Our Future, the Newt Gingrich super PAC, is run by a former Newt staffer. And the Rick Perry super PAC, Make Us Great Again, was started by Mike Toomey, who was Perry's chief of staff and co-owns an island with Dave Carney, Perry's <laughs> chief strategist. And I briefly kind of ran for president in South remember Carolina that. in January. Yeah. So I gave, it to, I gave it to this guy who I barely knew named John Stewart. Trevor, is being business partners a problem? Being business partners does not count as coordination oh. legally. Great. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, John, prepare yourself. Here we go. Trevor. Trevor, if you will, Colbert, Super PAC, transfer, activate. <laughs> Colbert Super PAC is dead. But it has been reborn as... The definitely not coordinating with Stephen Colbert Super PAC! Now that I uh, have the Super PAC, it is yes, mine. Sir. Can I run ads supporting uh, Stephen Colbert, who I believe in very deeply, and perhaps attacking his potential opponents, who I don't believe in at all? Yes, you can, as long as you do not coordinate. Can I legally hire Stephen's current Super PAC staff to produce these ads that will be in no way coordinated with Stephen? Yes. <laughs> what will become of the money? <laughs> who's, who's asking? Uh, we're Americans for better tomorrow, tomorrow. Right. And starting first thing tomorrow, we're going to figure out how to make the world a better place. Yeah. Tomorrow. In the meantime, yeah. we're just collecting money. I see. It's funny until you think about it. The fact of the matter is Stephen Colbert has proved by going before the Federal Election Commission, by becoming a super PAC, by now handing the super PAC over to his buddy John Stewart so that he can go and run to be president of South Carolina, he is proving how ridiculous this system has become.